Hello and welcome to Jerry's Live. I'm your host Mott Tuman, and tonight we are going to be talking all about light boxes. So I have to do a little bit of explaining before we get too far into things about what a light box is because I know they're pretty unfamiliar to some people out there but I can show you guys I have actually two different examples right here. I have a light box and a shadow box and you'll actually hear these terms used interchangeably. So this is what I'm going to call my light box which as you can see right now is only a few layers of paper in here and I'll show you in just a second it lit up because this can actually be lit up hence light box and then on the other side here I have a shadow box which sometimes you will hear people refer to light boxes as shadow boxes they're kind of interchangeable um, but this one would not be lit up like a lantern like the other one can be and they're constructed a little bit differently so depending on what you want and what you're envisioning for your project. If you try to do this, you might want to do one or the other. But that's essentially what there are, is they're layered paper that you typically put in like a frame or a panel of some sort, and then you would either light it from behind or you would just hang it as is. Uh, but that's what we will be creating tonight. They're just kind of this fun little project that you can do either for your portfolio or your wall art. And I'm hoping it'll be something that's kind of like a neat, fun project that you can do on your own. But before we get too far into that, I do have to say that tonight's class code is JL319. That will be the code that if you go to jerryzonorama.com and type that into the search bar, you'll be able to pull up the teacher's cart where all of the supplies for the show will be found. So if you're looking for anything in particular, that's where you'll be able to find. I'm sure our moderators will also link that in the chat for you guys. So light boxes, they're, they're not too complicated, but there's a few like key things that you should know if you want to make one. So if we can actually go to our overhead camera here, I can show you guys what this bad boy looks like lit, and lit up. So this is a light tablet, which would be super helpful if you guys are creating one of these. Um, obviously, if you're going to hang something like this on a wall, it's easier if you have LEDs or something like that that you can stream in the back. And I'm hoping you guys can see it well. It's a little bit blown out because we have our studio lights right now. But you can see there's a couple layers of paper right here. And so as the light comes through, everything, all these little details are going to show up. And you can layer an image essentially. So everything that is closest to us, like the layers that are closest to us, are going to show up as your darkest values. And then every layer that's further back is going to be your lightest values. And I'm actually going to end up taking this apart so I can show you guys how I constructed it. And this is actually only three layers of paper. Um, I actually have a layer of tracing paper in the middle here to try and give it a little bit of a foggy effect. Let me see if I can tilt this a little bit to give you guys to there. That's a little bit of a better view of what's going on in this light box since I know our studio lights are blowing this out a little bit. But this is what a light box is, is that if I turn this over, this is actually just a deep set frame. That I have a piece of backing paper on right here, but I didn't tuck it in all the way because I knew I'd gonna take it out. But you can see that I just have my few sheets of paper stuck in there very easily. So that's what we're gonna be building. Uh, I'm gonna show you this other shadow box really quickly before I get too ahead of myself. But this is what I would consider to be a shadow box. Again, you'll hear people call light boxes shadow or light box. So it depends on what you want, um, but they're constructed a little bit differently. So this one is over here is constructed so that um, the light is taken into account. So you can see the layers lit in that very particular way where you're keeping in mind the values and what values you want to be darkest and what things you want to be closest or farthest away from you. This is not one that can be lit from behind and it's created a little bit differently in that instead of building everything out from the edges, I can just stack things up and have like little bits of foam in between each layer of this that I've basically glued together so it's stacked. So if I had lit this from behind, which I actually can't, because this is made into a panel. This is actually a Da Vinci Pro panel that I've just inverted and built inside of. Um, so I can't light this one from behind, but if I would, you would essentially see all those little bits of foam and tacky bits that I've used to layer this up so it wouldn't look appealing if it was lit from behind. So that's a little bit of what the difference is between the two. Um, but there is a fun thing that you can do with shadow boxes like this is for one you can paint them uh, You can paint light boxes as well But it gets a little more complicated when it comes to values and things like that because you're not really focusing on color You're more focusing on values since you're going to be shining a light through it 
So these kinds of shadow boxes you can actually paint if you want them to look three-dimensional. The other thing you can do that I tried here is that I added a little bit of a pop-up book mechanism to it. So you can see if I pull this right here, um, this is an II for contacts. It is a type of lemur. Uh, and the thing about them is that they use this really long finger to tap on wood to find um, little grubs as their prey. So I had put in a little bit of a pop-up book mechanism that I modified to be able to get it to tap that finger so it can be a little bit interactive. And that's not something that you can really do with light boxes since anything that you shine a light through is going to have some kind of transparency and you'd be able to see that whole mechanism there, which could be cool but also could look a little bit clunky on your light box. So. That's a little bit of what the difference is. And what I should talk about now is material. So first of all, uh, a light tablet's gonna be super helpful. I'm gonna walk you guys through how I constructed this to show you guys, um, cause these shadow boxes are a little more straightforward. Um, but a light tablet is gonna be super helpful if you wanna construct a light box and you're worried about the light coming through. And the other things that are gonna be super helpful are a cutting mat, which is what the back of our table is right here. This is a self-healing cutting mat. So I'm not worried about cutting on this. It doesn't actually like mold together again once I cut it, but it, it's super durable and it's gonna withstand your cuts really well and you're not gonna be worried about cutting your table. Um, but the most important thing you gotta think about when you're constructing these types of light boxes is what kind of paper you're going to use. Because different types of papers will give you very different results. So I have a few different types of paper right here that I'm gonna show you guys. Um, the type of paper that I actually used over here, this is Bristol paper. And I could even invert that so you guys can see it from the other side, unlit without the backing paper. This is Bristol paper and in between here is actually a layer of tracing paper. So that is what I used for that. But you can also use something like watercolor paper, which is what I had used for the shadow box over here. Um, key thing is when you're constructing these kinds of boxes, like I said, this is all supported from the edge. So all of these details in here have to be able to support themselves. So your paper has to be a little bit thicker and a little bit heavier to be able to do that. If you use a really light weight paper, like even like this tracing paper, I don't have any details or anything cut into it. I kind of layered it in just so we can have a little bit of a foggy atmospheric perspective, um, foggy atmospheric effect. But if I had cut into, tried to cut little details into that, or even larger details, the paper might end up um, sagging a bit, so it wouldn't be able to support itself as well, and wouldn't be as great for a light box. So that's something you really need to think about, is that you want to use a bit of a thicker paper for a lot of your supporting structure, or if you're doing really, really fine details, a thicker paper is going to help you for that. So Bristol and watercolor paper are kind of my go-to. And I can show you guys even that when you shine light through them, they'll give you slightly different effects, which is something that you can play around a lot with. So I have this New York Central watercolor paper right here. And I'll even get out a piece of Bristol really fast. And I believe I have Soho Bristol paper. So if I pop a sheet of this out really quickly, and then I get my light table back on, you can see a little bit of the difference. So this is Bristol paper over here. And I know it's, again, hard to see with our studio lights, but the watercolor paper has a bit more of a bluish cooler tint to it. And then the Bristol paper has a bit more of this yellowish tint to it. I know it's kind of hard to see. You can see it a little bit better if I move them around a little bit. But different types of paper that you use will get you slightly different colors and slightly different values. So the watercolor paper is a little bit thicker. And it's blocking a little bit more of the light, so it's gonna give you a darker value in your final picture. And then another piece that you can use is, again, tracing paper, um, which I showed you in here. You can do lots of different fun effects with it. Um, excuse me. <coughs> uh, again, Mott needs to drink more water. <laughs> I was coughing on the last show, too. But you can see a bit here, I'm actually gonna turn this out because I see that it's being blown out on screen. Uh, the tracing paper is adding like a little bit of shading to it, but not a whole lot. So it's giving a lighter value with still a little bit of shading detail added in. So there's a lot that you can play with when it comes to using different types of paper in your work. Uh, and it's something that you kind of have to plan out. And planning these out is really the hardest part. Actually constructing them is a bit easier. But I want to give you guys some tips. This is a fairly simple illustration that I have here. It's just a little bit of a wooded area and I have these little bushes and things happening down at the bottom. 
If you want to do a more complicated scene, planning it out is going to be like the easiest thing for you to do. Especially if you're doing something as complex as this crazy looking eye eye. Um, but there's a couple different ways that you can really construct things. So right here I have basically where every single object is in its own plane. So each of these trees is kind of its own separate piece. And this is kind of the easiest way to do things. And then over here I have it where each plane is a basically a different part of this creature. So um, several of these fingers in the hand, I have this top layer right here of these fingers. In between that, after that, I have this other finger. And then on a lower level is these bottom fingers down here. So I had to think very purposefully about how I was going to construct that. And part of that is because I hid that um, mechanism for flicking the finger down in between the fingers there. So I had to be able to have some diff kind of depth between them, but that kind of trick is going to help you have like more depth in your image. So the hand over here is just one solid piece. There's no layers to this hand, so it's not going to have as much depth as this hand over here. So you kind of have to think about that. How much depth do you want your image to have? Do you want to go, this is kind of like a simpler approach if you want a simpler image, and if you want if you're just starting out at this, I recommend just starting out with like each thing is in its own layer because that's kind of the easiest to conceptualize. And then once you get more complicated, oh, excuse me again, I'm so sorry, my throat is really kind of groggy tonight. It's been groggy for a little bit, so excuse me if I'm like pausing awkwardly, it's because my throat is dry. <laughs> but when you're going into constructing more in detailed characters, you're kind of starting to think a little bit about like what do I want to have more depth, like the face in this is just one solid plane, and that's partly because I cut it out of a different painting that I was doing. But if I had wanted this face to have more depth to it, I could have done something where this outer fur is the largest layer, and then each layer subsequently underneath that is getting further away. So maybe the eyes I have recessed a little bit. It would actually make it look a lot creepier if the eyes were kind of recessed in it. But that's something to think about a little bit. And I'm going to drink water really fast because my throat is super, super groggy. So if you guys have any questions, now's a good time to put them in the chat while I'm taking a break here. Oh. <coughs> I promise I'm not sick or anything. I'm just having one of those days. Okay. It's the weather. Yeah. <coughs> it is the weather a little bit. Okay. So that's kind of what we're going through and going for here. So I'm going to be showing you guys better steps on how to construct this. I'm really losing my voice. I'm so sorry, guys. <coughs> I'm so sorry. Huh. Okay. We're getting back into it here. Okay. So I'm going to walk you through exactly how I construct this. And to do that, I'm actually going to take it apart. And I'm sorry. But this is going to be the last time it probably looks pretty on the show because it is a little hard to get it back together. But I'll walk you guys through how to do it. So, <coughs> if I take each plane of this image out real fast, you'll see this is my back plane right there that I had cut out. Then I have this just plain sheet of tracing paper in between them. And then my final plane here. And all I have to fit them in this frame so sorry, I can't stop. <coughs> I really cannot stop, yeah. I'm gonna drink my water because Katie's motioning me to. I really gotta. <laughs> mm. We all have those days, right? <laughs> okay, we're good. But you guys can see here, I have my deep set frame that I have in the teacher's cart. I believe this is a two and a half inch deep set frame. Um, and what I've done is I've perforated some paper and made kind of this accordion type fold. Let me see if I can get the camera to focus on that so that I can essentially just slot each layer of my light box into these different folds. And I've seen a lot of people online do the same approach. <coughs> oh my gosh, I cannot stop coughing. <laughs> um, but I've seen people do it where they have one on each side. I did try that out, but something to keep in mind is that the larger you get in sizes for these, the more your paper's gonna wanna sag. So if you're doing something like this is a 11 by 17 inch frame right here. So 
At 11 by 17 inches, I was already having sagging if I just had these two sizes in. If you're doing a much smaller size, you might not have that problem, but I had to go in and I had to add these two sizes as well with that same accordion folded groove. And that's what's making, makes getting these types of frames in and out of this kind of difficult. It takes a little bit of finagling. So this is one way that you can get your, I, I'm gonna call each one of these a different frame. It's kind of like a different frame of an animation. So each one of these frames, that's how you would get them in and out of this, is that you're, take, you're essentially taking a piece of paper and I had to use Bristol for this because I wanted something with a little bit of sturdiness so that it wouldn't be just falling out. If you actually use a piece of paper that was a bit thinner, it might work a bit better for you because I had to score this since it was so stiff and I wanted to give you guys a few, I'm gonna give you some tips on how to use an X-Acto knife and how to cut out each of your slides effectively. But before that, I wanted to show you how you can have a little tip for getting these, which is to score the paper. Uh, and scoring, I mean, I feel like a lot of people know what scoring is, but in case you don't, it's just cutting the paper only part way through so that it's really easy to fold, but it's not gonna like break and crack and tear apart. So first of all, if you have the cap off your, off your blade, always know where it is, okay? So I'm gonna keep my hand on it and I'm gonna look, I have my ruler under the table here that I have to reach under for. And using a ruler like this is gonna be super helpful when you're scoring or cutting anything if you have something to guide it along. So that's what I'm gonna use this for. Uh, if you're going to be guiding cuts with an X-Acto blade, make sure your ruler one is a metal ruler so you don't cut into it all and also that it has a cork backing because this is gonna give you enough friction where your ruler's not gonna be sliding around and it's gonna lower your risk of accidentally cutting yourself. So I'm gonna move this out of the way really quickly. But all I have to do is line up, wherever you wanna be cutting, line up your ruler to that edge there and then you're just gonna be taking your X-Acto blade and running it very lightly across that point. You don't wanna be cutting into it, you barely wanna be adding any kind of pressure and then once you have that, you should be able to fold it very easily along that edge. And that's what I did in order to get that accordion fold. And then in order to get the other side of the accordion, I would score it again, but on the opposite side. So I'm gonna do that really quickly just to show you guys. I would score it again, but on the opposite side, alternating the different sides that I scored it on. And then again, whatever side you score it on, it's gonna wanna fold in the opposite direction. And that's kind of how I ended up getting that accordion fold to be able to tuck those in. So each one of these kind of V shapes that you create is gonna be a single frame. So however many frames that you're gonna want into your light box, you're gonna to have to do a little bit of math and figure out how many scores you're gonna to have to do for that. But that is how you do that. And again, really the most important thing whenever you're handling any kind of X-Acto blade is that when you're not using it, cap it, because that can very easily lead to you cutting yourself on accident. I have done it before. I've had an X-Acto blade sitting out without the cap or I just forgot to. Even if you're just switching things really quickly, if you put it down on the table, either put the cap on it or like keep your hand on it so you know where it is. So that is how I got these inserts on the side. But there are other ways that you can have your frame sitting within the box. Um, and that method is a little more similar to what I did for the shadow box over here, where I actually took just pieces of foam and I'll pull out here, I have some sheets of foam that I put in the teacher's cart. Uh, and this is just for backing and framing and things like that, but any kind of sheet of foam will do fine. So you get a sheet of foam and then you would essentially cut the edges of this into a square that you could then glue each of your frames to. So you're essentially making a frame for your frames, but a different type of frame, <laughs> different definition of frame. And same thing as before, when you're cutting this out, all you have to do is line them up and make sure you're cutting the entire way through. So, excuse me again. <coughs> I'm really trying. My voice is not trying though. <laughs> Some ice water. I think, I think I'm okay. It's feeling better the more I talk. So maybe I just needed to warm it up a little bit. So essentially every single layer that I would have, I would cut a new frame for it and have a square shape between each of these. And there's, the benefit of that is that you don't have to finagle each frame to get into this. 
And that's part of the reason why I said earlier that that would be the last time you would see this light box as pretty, because it's really hard to get the frames in and out of this when you have all four sides with the accordion fold like this for these larger sizes. So building a structure that you can glue under each of your frames like this is going to be a lot easier to get in and out of your light box because you can essentially build up a frame without putting it in this frame. We're having lots of different types of frames tonight, but <laughs> you can build up these foam structures on each layer of this, glue them together, and then insert them into your frame here as opposed to putting each individual sheet of paper in it. But that method is also more permanent. So if you think you might want to change your structure over time, or if you really just want to modify it in any way, like I had gone back and forth several times figuring out what kind of layers I wanted to include in between these. Um, and I wouldn't have been able to do that if I had just gone straight ahead and glued them together. So before you even want to think about putting your frames in this type of frame with your structures and everything, you want to really make sure you have it planned out well. So I'm actually going to be moving this out of the way here. I got this zoomed in a little bit because I wanted to show you guys how you can get really fine details when you're cutting and some tips for doing that. So that's why we're so zoomed in on our mat right now. So if there's anything that you want to see that you're not seeing in frame, just let me know and I'll make sure to show it to you guys. But I'm actually going to come back to move some stuff around. And I'm going to come back to my light table over here. And I'm just going to show you guys really quickly how I planned out these frames. And I know I really only have two frames here. I don't think you need very much in order to make these look very nice and appealing. Because um, really just having them lit from behind is a really beautiful effect even without a lot of different layers. But you can layer these up with a lot. Um, so if you're going to do that, if you're going to create a lot of different layers to have in your image, a tip is to make sure that you're numbering each of them. You can see I have just the tiniest corners of these numbered on the backs of these frames so that I know which order they're going to go into. And if you're doing something where you have that accordion fold on the inside of your frame, that's going to help you in order to put them in the correct order. Because even when I was putting them in that frame earlier, I had them numbered and I still was putting them in incorrectly. And then it was a pain to try and switch them out. So make sure you number each of your frames. And then the really the most complicated thing is figuring out what I actually already have these switched around. So what you want on top and what you want in the back. I mentioned earlier that anything that's going to be farther towards the back and closer to your light source is going to have a lighter value and that anything closer to you is going to have a darker value. The more paper that's layered, you know, the thicker that paper is going to get, the more it's going to block the light out. So you want to think about that, whether you're doing a character for this or a landscape. I find that these kind of tree landscapes are some of the easiest to do for these because it's kind of mimicking atmospheric perspective a little bit where the farther away things are getting, the lighter they're getting. So it's already kind of mimicking that. So I think they play in really well. But to create these, a few of the things that I had to keep in mind was something again that I talked about a little bit earlier, which was the structure. So each of these trees, you'll notice, I don't have a lot of points on these trees. Let me move that out of the way so you can see what I'm pointing at. That end without connecting to my border here. And another thing is, is that I have this border like, this is a very large border. I don't have a super, super thin border because I knew I wanted to do these really thin tree details. And the thinner details that you do, the thicker border you're going to want to have so that again, if I'm doing these really thin long trees, they're not going to be sagging a lot in my frame. So you kind of want to plan it out carefully where you're not going to have a whole lot of details that are dropping off the edge like this because if I had made this really, really long, it would start bending in on my image and it wouldn't look very good. So when I was building these trees, I tried to make sure that they were going to be connecting to each part of the circular frame that was going in. The other thing is you want to think about how you're going to like what what you want your values to look like. Whoops, I accidentally clicked that on there. So I'm just going to turn that off real fast. So if you do an illustration, you can then take that illustration and then turn it into a light box, which is easy to do, but also complicated. <laughs> it sounds funny. So when you're planning out these illustrations, I actually, I didn't, obviously this is fairly simple. I didn't do a full sketch before I planned this out because sometimes if you're working traditionally like this, if you're working from cut paper, just doing a straight illustration isn't going to be able to capture 
all of the layering that you can really accomplish through actually cutting paper out. So I recommend if you're going to do one of these and you want to do something really, really complicated, create a simpler version first with like cheaper scrap paper. And instead of like putting it in your box and getting it all ready, just have it laid out on your light table so that you can see what it looks like when it's layered up, but it's not like a finished product yet. You can kind of be a little bit rougher with it because when you're doing an illustration, just flat sketching it out two dimensionally, you're not going to be able to see all of the like areas b hidden behind these that you'll have to draw out later and you'll have to cut in later. So if you're doing something really complicated, it might be beneficial to you to actually just take paper and start cutting it out and work it layer by layer rather than doing an illustration and then cutting it out all at once. So that is kind of my tip for that. But you can see, I just started playing with just a little bit layering values. So I have this back layer here where I had started to build in all of these bushes. And then on my next layer, I was thinking about, okay, if I want to add more depth to these bushes, I can add a little bit smaller details in front of it to be able to capture those. And I just had to make sure once I cut this out, actually I put this on the light table and then I took my next blank sheet of paper and I layered it on top of that and then, you know, turned my light table on. And then I was able to see all of the different details. And from there I took my pencil and I drew out by hand what the next layer was going to be. So I built it like that rather than just having a sketch and trying to immediately work from that sketch and cutting the layers out of order. Cutting the layers in order from what you want back to front is gonna be the most helpful thing for you to be able to get this right. So that that's kind of my rundown on how you can get like your layers started and things to think about for what you want your illustration to be. But I did wanna talk a little bit more in depth on how you can get these tiny little details cut out. So if I turn that off really fast. That is, like, the first part is planning. That's the most complicated part. The second most complicated part is cutting it all out, obviously. So I have all these little tiny details that I had started cutting in and building in. Uh, and those can be really, really tricky when you're using an X-Acto knife because they're really easy to destroy. When you're, you can actually see here, I have this little sprig of leaves that I have and I can move my fingers so you can see. I'd had to accidentally broken that while I was cutting it. And part of the reason why that broke off is that while I was cutting it, I was cutting it in such a way that it was putting a lot of stress on that area and it caused it to break while I was cutting it. So something to keep in mind while you're cutting little tiny details like that. And I'm actually gonna draw something out really fast so that I can try cutting out for you, but it is gonna be like very small, so I'm gonna have to maybe use the dynamic here in a second to show you guys. So if I wanna have, let's say, a little tiny plant like that, and I'm just gonna draw it out really quickly. It's not gonna be anything pretty, but it's just gonna be a small little sprig. And I have to do this really small just so that you guys can see the larger you make these kinds of details, the less this will happen. So if I take my X-Acto blade and I start cutting out this tiny little sprig, what I'm gonna wanna do is cut with the direction of the drawing. And that can be a little hard to conceptualize at first, but essentially I have all of these, and I'm gonna remember to cap this before I put it down and start motioning. I have all of these little leaves that are going in this direction outwards, so I'm gonna make sure I'm cutting in the same direction as those leaves rather than against them. And so if I start coming into the side here, and this is where we can get our dynamic going so I can show you guys a little bit better what's going on. Here, there's our little tiny sprig that I'm gonna be cutting out. Um, but I have my X-Acto blade right here. I'm making sure when I'm cutting with my X-Acto blade that I'm not cutting like this towards my thumb right here. Always be aware of where all of your fingers are when you're doing this so that you don't accidentally have to like cut yourself. I mean, you don't have to cut yourself. You know what I mean? Um, so if I get start cutting this out, I'm going to make sure that my hand is over here and I'm going to start working in the direction of this leaf. So if I cut out this side here and I'm working in this direction, I want to make sure, sure when I come to this side that I'm cutting in the same direction again. And then up on this, and this is like something really 
it's very simple and it feels very intuitive like you're probably wondering why I'm pointing this out but I can show you guys really quickly if I come up here and I start cutting out this top leaf and then I decide I'm gonna move my paper around and cut from the other direction which by the way you should be moving your paper around a lot when you're using an exacto knife so that you're not putting yourself at odds when you're cutting so you're not in the way of your blade and also make sure that your blade is really well set in this so that it doesn't loosen up um, so I cut this leaf going out that direction. If I start cutting back in the opposite direction, I can show you guys a bit what happens, which I'm not sure you could see there. Let me cap that real quick. So let me see if I can get it on our camera. Basically what is happening is that the paper wrinkled a little bit because I put tension on it cutting in the opposite direction. So it, I cut out this direction at first and then came back in the opposite direction and that is what put tension on that leaf and that is what will tear your little tiny details when you're cutting them out. So if I go back, let me just cut this whole little guy out so you guys can see it. I'm gonna flip this around again so I can cut in the direction that I want to for these leaves. Or I can even, here, I can even, if I'm coming back down this way, I can actually switch to the opposite side and that might actually help me so if I cut all of these leaves going up in this direction and I cut each side of the leaf going in the same direction, then I can switch directions for the opposite side of this as long as I'm cutting everything again in the same direction. I'm gonna to try to make sure that this is focused on screen. So I'm gonna flip this around really fast. I can cut all of these leaves going in the same direction as long as I'm doing that same thing where each side is cut going the same way because if I'm cutting, this base of this is a little bit thicker, so it's going to take a little bit more force than these tiny little leaves will. But if I cut one side of this in this direction and then the opposite side also in that direction, over time, if I do that enough, I'm essentially pulling on this little joint lots of different times, just pulling, pulling, pulling on it. And that's actually what caused this leaf over here to break is that I was just cutting, 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 cutting in the same direction and actually tore that off. So little things to keep in mind when you're cutting these out is what, what direction you're cutting in and how that's gonna put tension on your leaves. And you can see I actually cut that little tiny leaf out on accident because I wasn't paying enough attention. It's definitely important to pay attention when you're using an X-Acto knife. So I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna cut out this little circle that I built. I'm not gonna be this is just a little sketch, so I'm not gonna be super precious with it. But you can see too, when I did that, I rotated the paper rather than trying to rotate the blade and cutting it away from myself at, like that because that's just not a very um, sturdy way to hold your blade if you're cutting like this, pulling away from yourself and then trying to pull back in like that. You're gonna feel it on your wrist after a while. So it's a lot easier if you turn your paper rather than trying to force your wrist to bend. So, have I cut this all the way through? Let me see. I haven't quite. That's another thing too. I'm gonna have to cough again. <coughs> I am so sorry. That's another thing too. When you're doing this and you think you've cut all the way around, sometimes it can take pulling on this a little bit to get it off. But if you feel too much pressure, don't just like tear it. You know, try to go back in and if you've cut a lot of little details and you don't want to cut every single detail again, what I like to do is I go in and I basically just poke areas that I think might still be holding it on. Like that just popped it off right there because just poking it in is going to cut that little area rather than me having to cut every single individual detail again. So let me see if I can get this out. And then very carefully pull that off. I hope my hand didn't block that too much, but you can see now we have our tiny little sprig that I've cut out there. Uh, and you'll notice too, something that just happened that you need to be aware of is that I just broke the very, very tip of this X-Acto blade, which is, it's super small and I don't think you'll be able to see it on camera, but keeping your X-Acto blade sharp is super, super important. So we can actually come back to our overhead here if you're doing a lot of cutting with an X-Acto blade, 
it's gonna dull out over time, especially if you're using really thick paper, like this Bristol paper. Uh, the more you cut, the more it's gonna dull out. And the duller it gets, the more force you're gonna be trying to put on when you're doing this kind of light box work. And that can lead to you cutting yourself and getting injured a lot more easily. If you're putting a whole lot of force down when you're cutting these, you shouldn't need to absolutely bear down on this. And if you're using a material where you're really bearing down on everything, it's better to go over the same area multiple times than it is to just jam into it. Like, it wasn't the case. I'm using this foam. This foam is really, really easy to cut through. But if you're using something like cardboard, cardboard oftentimes can take multiple cuts and either they'll get it all the way through. So if you're doing something like that, just take your time. Use like a ruler or anything like that. Keep it hold in place and just do the multiple cuts rather than trying to force your way through because then that's where you can get stuck and end up accidentally cutting yourself, which is very much not ideal. So I have that going so far. <coughs> I am really like, my voice is going away a little bit. So we're gonna try to make this episode a little bit short and sweet for my sake. So if you guys do have any specific questions or if you've tried light boxes before, please let me know or post them in the Jerry's Live Facebook group. So we have a Jerry's Live Facebook group. Everyone's free to join. People post their art there for critique. It doesn't have to be anything specific to Jerry's Live. Um, but if you go in there, just make sure you answer the security question. Otherwise, we can't deem you in. Can't, can't let you in because we will deem you a robot. My brain was getting that sentence a little mixed up. But if you guys have done light boxes before, I would love to see them. There's a lot of really fun things that you can do with them. But before I wrap this up, I wanted to show you guys a little bit on how I made this mechanism right here because I, I finagled around with it for a very long time. So I do want to show you guys because it was a lot of work and I'm actually very proud of it. So if I get a sheet of paper out here and I believe I actually have, yes, some watercolor paper. And I should, I just remember too, when I was looking down below my desk there, um, glues that you can use to do this with. So tape is super helpful for this if you're building up layers like in the shadow box, just taping them to see how they look before you're finalized and using a really low tack tape, like something like this white Artist Pro painter's tape. The lower the tack, the better, um, because you'll less risk tearing your paper. But for your final draft of this, I really recommend using something like neutral pH adhesive like this, or like a this is a PVA glue, polyvinyl acetate. These types of glues are super helpful for these because they're archival. They're the same type of thing that's used in book binding. So I highly recommend this type of glue. It does take a little bit to dry, but I just remembered that, so I wanted to point it out. But really quickly, I wanted to show you guys how I did it, which this was a pop-up book mechanism. So you can definitely take a lot of inspiration from pop-up books when you're doing this kind of building. But something to keep in mind is that pop-up books work because they build off of the mechanism of your page opening. So that like squash and stretch of the page opening is how those mechanisms move. So I had to modify it a bit since I'm not opening or closing a page, which is part of the reason why I have this pull tab here instead. Uh, but the way this works is really interesting. It's actually the same way that you would build a wheel, how you would get a wheel to turn in a pop-up book. So basically you start out with a little piece of paper and you're gonna fold it around like the three quarter mark. You're just gonna put a little fold in it. And I'm gonna make one here really quickly just so you guys can see how it works. And then from that, once you have that fold set in, you would then fold along this line here to get a triangle built in. So if I fold along that line, and this paper is a little bit thick, so I gotta squash it down a little bit. So I have that little hinge right there then I can open this back up, and once I open it and get it to move the way I want it to, you can see I have a little bit of a triangle built in there. And from this point, I can then go and cut out a little tiny L-shaped bracket. So, 90 degree bracket, just like that, in the corner there. I'm gonna cut this out really fast. And this is just gonna be a really quick little wheel mechanism that they use in pop-up books. 
And I took inspiration from pop-up books for this. I highly recommend you do that if you do shadow boxes because there's so many cool things that they do. If any of you guys have seen, um, I can't remember his first name right now, Reinhardt. Matthew Reinhardt. Matthew Reinhardt. He does a lot of really, really cool pop-up books. He's a master, honestly. Yeah. Yeah, if you guys have any of his books, oh my gosh, I have one of his, and it's just, it's gorgeous work. Um, but I took inspiration from him for this eye eye that I made here. So I'm gonna use tape for this instead of glue, just so that I can do it really fast. So let me grab my roll of tape down here. And I'm just gonna fold it in on itself a bit so I can tap it down really fast. What I'm going to do is I'm going to stick it just on one part of this L shape. And then from there, I'm going to stick it down into the corner fold right on the edge. So I'm going to take my L shape bracket and I'm just going to stick it right into that fold. So it's like that and tape it down. So when it's folded, it should just have the top edge tucked in there. And then from there, when you open this, you'll see that the L shape, it doesn't actually turn, but it mimics that kind of turning mechanism. So if I even took really quickly, if I cut out a little circle, and I should be turning the paper here rather than, not the cleanest circle in the world, but that's okay. So from there, you would take your little circle mechanism, and actually I might, need glue for this. So I'm not sure if I'm going to be able to get something that works in time to show you guys with the glue drying, but you would take a little tiny circle and you would glue it right at that little, here, let me hold this up so you guys can see. Focus for me. Yeah. You'd glue it right at that corner of the L where that very tip of the fold of this is glue it right there. And that's how you get that wheel turning mechanism in pop-up books is that essentially this is built so that every time you open or close the page, that L bracket will turn. And that's what's creating that like tapping motion in my shadow box right here. And the way I modified this to work with the shadow box rather than a page opening and closing is that I actually glued this part of it to the top layer. So I had glued it to the back of this wood that I had painted in here. And then on this side of it, I had actually had a longer sheet of paper that I had folded and attached so that it came out this way. And that's what I'm pulling right here is this branch. That is that mechanism. So every time I pull it, it's going to be getting that finger to tap like that. They're really cool. Um, and there's lots of little things like that that you can learn from pop-up books and then take and turn into stuff like shadow boxes. So great place to find inspiration if you're looking for great inspiration. It's all layered paper. So if you're looking for stuff to find inspiration, even for like your light boxes and how you should stack things, especially for characters. I know sometimes I look through like Reinhardt's work and see how he's stacking character images, like how he cuts out a specific leg and how he makes those joints layered. Cause sometimes like the joint of the leg is layered on top of the body. Sometimes it's below the body, depending on how it's gonna be moving. That kind of stuff is where you can find some really genius ideas for this light box and shadow box work. Yes, we have a question. With the light box, um, if you were to watercolor the paper, do you think that that would affect the way that the light, like it would tint it the color, yes? Uh, it would, it depends. So it depends. So I recommend if you really, really want something to be a specific color, it's a better idea to use colored paper than it is to paint it because that paint, what it's doing is that it's not turning the internal core of this paper a different color. It's just tinting the outside. So since this paper is thick, you might not actually get a lot of that tone of the color in, especially since watercolor paper is very, very thick. Uh, instead, you might just get a slightly darker area when you go and you light it from underneath because that pigment and that paint that is sitting on top is just blocking out a little bit more light. So you'd get a little bit of the color, but it wouldn't be very effective. So that's why painting these doesn't always work particularly well. If you were doing a black and white painting, like if you took acrylic or acrylic wash, you did black and white values on top of this, that would actually be very effective, mainly because like acrylic and acrylic wash can be super, super opaque, especially that Turner acrylic wash, like that black 
Any black Turner or Quill wash paint is so, so opaque. And if you use that on this, it would black out value really, really well. So if you want to paint it, I'd lean more towards doing that than doing something like watercolors. Uh, but that's kind of why. The more you play around with different colors, the more you see some colors will block out light a lot more, especially if they're more opaque colors. And more transparent colors like that are common in watercolor might not show up as well because they're not tinted enough. So that's a bit of the trade-off when it comes to painting things. So my voice is really struggling. If we have any more questions, put them in the chat now. So let me know if we do, because I think I'm going to start wrapping up here to save you guys from me coughing anymore. I have one question. Yes. One more? Yes, go ahead. Um, Libby was asking about adding the lights to the actual frame mm -hmm. of your uh, light box. Yeah. Do you have any recommendations on how to do that? Yes. So uh, if I pull out my picture frame right here, this would be a little bit better if I had these set in. I uh, highly recommend when you do this, leave space. So you can put as many frames as you want in here. You might just need to make your accordion folds like tighter and smaller. Um, but if you leave space on the back of this, this is where you can take a sticky tab of LED lights and just line the edge of it. And you would line it all the way around. And then ideally like this doesn't have a backing to it. If you get a frame that has a backing, you would have to cut a little tiny corner in the edge of this so that you can bring the wire out. And from there, you could then, you know, hook that up to your outlet. So I really recommend playing around with just looping it around the edge. And then also you can play around with the position of your lighting. So I just have my light box right here that shines light straight through the back of it. So lining your LED around the entire edge is going to mimic that effect the best. So if you're planning this out and using a light box to figure out what the values are going to look like, that's going to be the best option for you. But if you want to create effect where it's like lit from the bottom, you can of course just put a stream of LED lights just on the bottom of this and play around with that or on the sides, play around like what areas the light's coming from. But that would be the easiest way you do this if you're gonna hang this on a wall. And speaking of which, I did wanna talk about really quickly how you can mount something like this. Cause this is, like I said, just a Da Vinci panel. Like this is just a painting panel that I inverted and used the backside of. Um, I do have a little bit of hardware right here that I used to paint it on the wall and I wanted to mention before any of this stops how you can put that hardware on. So let me move around. I have a bunch of stuff under here. This is another Da Vinci panel. You can see right here, um, this is your hardware. If I just put it into any point on the back of this, you'll see the thinner part is going to crack and this can really damage your shadow box. If you've built a really nice shadow box and you end up hammering this type of hardware, which I have in the teacher's cart, through this thin panel, you're gonna end up with cracking. So I recommend if you do something like this where you just invert your panel, you're gonna wanna make sure and mark out that you have this coming through this thicker portion of your panel. And it actually might be good too. This works for the Da Vinci panels. Like it's not gonna crack if you just hammer one of these in. But if you're using a different type of panel that you're not as familiar with, uh, maybe do a test test area first with maybe you have a panel lying around that you're not like happy with or something like that or you don't care about. Uh, I would test it out first because this is the type of hardware. You can use any type of hardware for this. The little d rings included as long as you hammer them again into this thicker portion. Uh, but this is the type of hardware that you just, you don't uh, have to drill anything in first. You just hammer it straight in. So if you are worried about your wood cracking at all, test it out beforehand. If you're using these Da Vinci panels, you shouldn't have to worry about it. It does work if you just hammer it in. But you just have to make sure before you measure it out that you're getting in that hard edge rather than this really thin backing. So that was the other thing I wanted to make sure to include before I let you guys go. But... Thank you guys so much for coming. I'm sorry for my voice failing so much. I guess I just caught up here and started talking a lot and realized that my voice was not gonna be working today. But thank you for bearing with me through that. I was very happy to show you all these little things. If there's any questions that you think of after the show has ended or if I didn't answer any of them, um, I'll be going back through the Facebook comments tomorrow and answering anything that you guys might have. So don't worry if I didn't get to it or you think of something later. And also you can go into our Jerry's Life Facebook group. There's a great community there where people like to post their art and get critiques and things like that. If you would like to join that, please do. Next week is going to be an Emmy show and she's going to be doing water-soluble 
oil oil are they oil pastels no i think they're just water soluble charvin pastels soft pastels excuse me water soluble soft pastels uh she's gonna be doing a landscape with them and that should be really fun so i'm pretty excited for that but again thank you guys so much for coming tonight and bye <laughs>